Buenos días. Um, I have a question for everybody first. Why is this conference in English? Yeah. When, when, when Paradigma called me and, and asked me, hey, you want to do a presentation in Big Data Spain? I said, awesome. You know, first time in my career that I get to do uh, a technology conference speaking in, in my own language. And it's going to be good, it's going to be, and then now it's in, it's in English. I said, damn you, Paradigma, damn you guys. <laughs> so um, moving on, um, thank you very much for coming. Um, this is, uh, my name is Mariano, I'm here with my friend, co-worker, and director of data development for uh, Expedia, Anselmo. He's going to take over the presentation at the point that it becomes super boring, then he takes over and, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm the CTO for Expedia Partner Solutions, so I'm going to tell you a little bit first about who we are. Hopefully we, you know us. Um, uh, we are the world's travel platform, right? We are the Expedia Group, we work for the Expedia Group. Um, you surely can guess that Expedia Group has run Expedia, Expedia.com, Expedia.es here in Spain. We also have Hotels.com, uh, you probably know that as well. But there are many other really, really big brands that, that, w that, we, that are also part of our travel platform and our travel group. Um, a very, very good example, of course, we have Trivago. Probably not, not many of you guys know that Trivago is, is, is one of the Expedia Group companies. Uh, we have Travelocity, we have Orbit, uh, but then interestingly, uh, HomeAway as well. And HomeAway is one of the largest vacation rentals platforms in the world, uh, and it's part of the Expedia Group. And that is actually a very interesting uh, synergy that, that it's, it's very relevant to, to the rest of my talk. So a few, a little bit of, information about Expedia, which makes hopefully what we're going to show you next a little bit more relevant. Um, we're, we're quite big, right? We have 600 million visits in more than 75 countries that we operate, more than 20,000 employees. Uh, I think last year we did 90 billion USD in sales a year. That is probably the biggest travel platform in the world. Uh, we have more than 10,000 affiliates, different type of affiliates. Um, but as you can see, uh, you know, we have a very interesting scale problem and a very interesting scale opportunity. Um, there is a secret, and this is our secret. I'm putting here at the beginning of the PowerPoint. Um, we're about travel. Everybody in Expedia loves travel, and you could say we're a travel company, but if you ask any experience, uh, and there are some of here in this room, Probably half of you are from Expedia, otherwise you know, just, just a few. Um, we're a technology company. We're an engineering company, right? Everything in Expedia uh, is about technology, is about how we use technology, is about what we do with the technology to bring people closer and bring the world within reach for those people. Um, every decision, there is always a technology team and technology people in the room, right? So this is not the typical model of traditional companies where um, you know, the, there is a business side of the company, and that business side makes decision about the strategy of the company, and then they just dump all of that into the technology guys and say, figure it out, right? Your um, experience is, is a little bit kind of the other way around sometimes. Um, so we embrace technology, we do technology for a living, and of course data and data science, which is also part of technology. And, and we saw very early on the power of that that can have in our products, and, and in the experience that we give to our, part, to our uh, customers. So within Expedia, I work for the Expedia Group Partner Solutions, which is the B2B side of Expedia. Um, we, we power more than 1,000 companies, so we, we have more than 1,000 partners that they use, and they get all the Expedia inventory and products um, through our, our uh, systems. Of course, our flagship digital product is our API, which is most certainly uh, I'm quite certain it is the biggest public API in the travel industry right now. We do more than like 600 million searches a day. Uh, we have been growing massively every year because you know we're taking all those awesome Expedia products and giving it to many, many other companies. And a little bit relevant to what we're here today, we process around 10 terabytes of data per day. Um, so it's a very interesting data challenge and data opportunity we're going to talk about. 
a few of our partners, I have to say this, these are the guys who make us great. Uh, as, as you can see, a lot of companies that you probably know uh, worldwide, not just in Europe or in the US, uh, that they all get all this, a lot of inventory, a lot of really, really awesome products from Expedia. So, interesting things that have happened and are happening in the travel industry that, that create opportunities and challenges for us. Augmented reality and VR. If you haven't watched that movie, don't watch it. Read the book first. It's a lot better. And it's an awesome book, probably one of my favorite ones, and then watch the movie. Uh, but basically, you know, uh, we're already working very hard on augmented reality and VR. Um, if, you, if you've been on holidays, you know, you, you surely been, you, can, you probably know that if you, if you get a bad flight, you buy a holiday from Expedia, from anyone else. If you get a bad flight, you have a few painful hours, but after that is, okay, I'm out of here. But if you get a bad hotel, or you get a hotel that you, you're not happy with, that is not catered for you, it's not the best for you, your whole holiday can be ru ruined, right? So it's, it's very important, and people spend a lot of time looking at the content that we provide for the hotels, and we have the best content in the industry. Uh, but this is, this is about to change, right? Everybody, many of you probably have a VR headset already, uh, augmented reality with your phones. We have to completely rebuild our data structure and data strategy around content, which is, again, one of the most important things about selling a holiday uh, around augmented reality and VR, right? You, you want to give the, the customer the ability to really go into a hotel and really see every aspect of the hotel before they make a final decision. And, and for some families, the holiday that they're going to take this year, the, the amount of money they're going to spend, is the most important financial decision they're going to make in the whole year. So, so we want to assist them, we want to give them the best possible opportunity to do that in, in the best possible way. But from a technical perspective, most of you probably are technologists, you realize it's a complete overhaul of our content systems, uh, which is one of the most important systems we have. Another interesting, and all these opportunities and challenges are quite connected to each other. So another one is the market is growing for us. There is consolidation. Expedia had added hundreds of thousands of new properties this year into, into our systems. So every day you go to Expedia.com, you want to search something, you're going to see a new property. I mentioned before HomeAway. We're integrating all the HomeAway properties into Expedia and the whole Expedia group landscape, which means you don't have just the hotels anymore, you have all the vacation rentals, right? So if you, before you, you want to go to Paris, you have a thousand hotels there, now you're gonna have a thousand hotels plus another thousand, two thousand, whatever the number of, of vacation rental flats there. And if you guys have uh, used a vacation rental before, you can see that sometimes it's, it's as good as a hotel, even better, right? So, so, so our data is growing, our supply is growing massively, which is good for the customer, but it creates a lot of challenges for us as well. For every new hotel that we add or every new property that we add, we have a whole new set of content, of course. We have, of course, the property data, but then we also have billions or millions of fair price combinations, right? So our, our pricing engine becomes, you know, it's, it's growing exponentially because it's billions and billions of more prices to calculate every day. Every time, I mentioned before, we do 600 million searches a day. Um, and imagine that multiplied by 100 hotels, 200 hotels, 100,000 hotels, 200,000 hotels. Um, so, so basically, this, this growth is fantastic for the company, fantastic for our users, but us as technologists is bringing a, a very, very, very important challenge, not only to, my, to have to manage that data, but also to be able to give our customers what they want, which is connected to the third point, another travel industry challenge and opportunity, which is voice and personalization. So over the past 20 years, I've been lucky that I spent almost 18 years in the travel industry and was one of the first industries that was properly disrupted by e-commerce and by the internet. Um, and, and interestingly, of course, a lot of people have been shifting their, their buying habits towards online and you know, right now it's online industry is bigger than the, the, the retail industry, but the retail industry is still there. Actually, we power many of retail partners. And there is a massive difference still between going to Expedia, going to Trugao, going to HomeAway, going to Orbit, um, and searching there, then going to a travel agent and talking to somebody that if you go there often, they know you, they know what, they, what you want, they know what type of hotel you want, they know which holidays you took. So there is a personalization component that travel industries have, or retail travel industries have, that no company has taken online yet, 
Uh, and that is a very interesting data challenge as well. And that's something that where all these technologies that we're talking about in this conference, you know, data, machine learning, AI can help out with that. And voice search, it's a little bit of that, but then because personalization becomes a very critical factor in voice, because basically you go to Expedia right now, you search for a hotel in Paris, you get a thousand results. We add all the vacation rentals, you get 2,000 results. If you're in front of a computer and you have patience, you know, I think the average, the average customer use, uh, spends at least 17 or 18 hours browsing through the content, you know, you can look all the pictures. But if you want to search through Alexa, you're not going to stand there and say, okay, Alexa, tell me what hotels I can use in Paris. And say, okay, result number one of 2,000, you know, this hotel and this crowd. You're not going to sit there for two hours just listening to Alexa uh, tell you everything that's available. So that's our job, and it's one of the very strong use cases we have in data science where hey, we need to give, there's only room for one or two options, you know, maybe three. So from all these hundreds of thousands of properties, billions of potential fair combinations, we need to be able to select those few specific results that this customer, he or she wants. Um, and that is a fantastic data challenge, a fantastic opportunity, but then also that if you don't do it right, you end up with a horrible user experience, as I think Oscar was t talking about before. So some of our um, data science use cases, some of how we're spending our time and our effort uh, sorting, of course, very relevant to what I said and very relevant to what we're seeing in the industry. It's, it's, it's a massive difference in conversion if you sort the right property. And that sorting is not a static sorting. The, the best sorting for me is not the best sorting for you, and it's not the best sorting for somebody in Hong Kong. Um, so it's, it's combining that personalization with sorting, with what type of traveler you are, with what we know about you. So this is one of the biggest use cases we have right now, and we're using plenty of different tools, and someone's going to talk about it later to enable that and to empower that. And again, 600 million searches a day. This is a huge amount of data we consume every second to try to do this. Um, image classification. Would you go to that hotel over there? It's actually a good hotel. I have never been, but you know, I heard this. And there is a fantastic presentation from our director of data science, Nuno, um, about how we did that. This, but basically, the hero image of a hotel in search results is super important, right? The first image you see, it's, it's incredibly important to try the conversion. And some hotels have 20, 30 images. So for us to select which is the best image for each hotel, especially when, the, when we are in hundreds of thousands of hotels every year, it's not that easy, it's not that simple. And even sometimes what the hotel thinks is the best image is not really the best in conversion. So in this case, it's actually interesting because we use Mechanical Turk, an AWS service. I don't know if you guys heard about it. Uh, but basically use people as a service to try to sort a, a sample of all the images we have and say, okay, which one of all these images from the hotel is your preferred? And we took all that data from the actual manual sorting from, from real people, thousands of people, and then we use that to train our algorithms. This is what most of the people selected. And then we apply that to, um, to, to our entire data set of all the images of all the hundreds of thousands of hotels to resort and reshuffle the best order for the images of one specific hotel once you're already there. And of course, the, the best hero image. Um, and then after, after doing that, we actually test A-B tested or MBT multiple different algorithms, multiple results, right? And we can see in real time what is uh, the customer reaction. And you know, I can already tell you the results were amazing, right? Um, forecast and anomaly detection, uh, detection. So this is an interesting case. We put it up here because it's not just customer facing. It's not, all, it's not just giving the customer a better product. It's also for us to run our business uh, better. If you look at the numbers I, sent, I showed before, um, in a very, if most of our core systems are down for a minute in Expedia, we lose thousands of dollars, right, for one minute. Um, you put that to many minutes a year, it's a significant amount of business. These are the problems that you have at scale. Um, and basically, we develop our own internal systems to try to uh, forecast, but then also to try to detect anomalies, which sometimes, okay, if the whole system is down, it's kind of easy to detect because there are people shouting all over the place. But sometimes it's, you know, this point of sale for this particular destination, for this particular hotel is not selling, and it's supposed to be selling. That's where the data is too big to consume for our operations team or any, any person itself. And that's where our system kicks in and detects, okay, you know, this, type, this very specific use case is failing. And you find out. And, and at, a, at a scale of Expedia, 
those things eventually end up to be a significant amount of revenue that we could lose. Boys and bots. Uh, I talked about voice already. Um, you probably heard a lot about chatbots in this conference over the last few days. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but basically, you know, part of the part of our customer experience is not just the sell part, but also the support side, right? And, and we want to make that support uh, the best po uh, the best possible. And some some customers, many customers, including myself, they don't want to call somebody, they want to talk, they just want to chat, and that's where we have a massive opportunity to reduce the cost and therefore make make the service even better for everyone. Um, this is a very straightforward use case, and again, very very um, related to to what I said before, um, it's very important for us, and you know, who, who many of you probably been to Amazon before, and you know, one of the interesting features in Amazon is you're buying one thing and say, hey, other people like this as well, we recommend these other products, right? And that doesn't happen in trouble very often lately. This is the personalization component where, hey, if you like this hotel, uh, based on your history, we can recommend all these other properties as well, and we can cross sell you another other properties. So that's another very interesting use case, how we use data science. Uh, to actually improve our product and therefore improve our business. So finally, as a, as a CTO, my job is to bring problems into my team. Uh, and I'm very good at that. So then I can relax and let the team sort it out. And that's what Anselmo and his team do. So what are the challenges we have? Kind of a summary of what I've been talking about. We have a huge amount of data with completely different uh, meaning, right? We have partner data, we have supply data, we have customer data. Um, we have very different types of data that we need to try to figure it out all together and create the right context for our machine learning and our artificial intelligence to make the right decisions. Supply size, I mentioned it many times. It's, it's big and it's growing, uh, and therefore um, it, it becomes a completely different problem when you reach a certain scale. Partner size, you know, we need to, we cut there, we have more than 1,000 partners all around the world, and all the partners were want the same thing or, need, or have the same problem, so we need to cater for all of them. Content side, you know, more than a million images, as I mentioned before, that we need to sort out and we need to uh, use in the best possible way, and 10 terabytes per day. You know, that's the amount of data that we generate right now. We're growing double digits every year at XP Partner Solutions, therefore, you know, it's becoming bigger, 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 so we actually need our, our data um, architecture to, and, and our data services to be able to scale at that pace even faster because we want to rebuild everything we have every year, right? Um, and, and a couple of years ago, XP announced that we're moving everything to AWS, and that gave Anselmo and I the opportunity to start rebuilding most of the data lake and data warehouse products that we have, and we build it with an AWS mindset, um, and therefore with the scalability that we need, and we know that all these new technologies and the new customer behaviors are going to require in order to keep, uh, for us to keep giving a good service. So uh, my name is Anselmo, as Mariano was saying, I run data technology at Expedia Partner Solutions. When uh, we started to um, migrate our data platform to the cloud, we wanted basically to leverage the capabilities that the cloud provides to us. Not only to benefit our business, but also to benefit our users and our partners. Uh, our scale is immense and increasing every single day. Uh, the only way we actually can operate an effective scale is to leverage the capabilities of uh, and, and exploit the uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science. For that, uh, with the opportunity of building a data platform in the cloud, we define a couple of guiding principles that we follow, essentially to lower the barrier to produce data, uh, enforce governance, quality, and security, but most importantly, also to facilitate the way people consume data. Let's go through it. Uh, first of all, the cloud migration plan. We had like three main motivators. We wanted to follow the data producers that moved to the cloud. So those 10 terabytes of data suddenly stopped to be produced on-prem and start to be produced in the cloud. And for that, it was important to be efficient and to be close to them. The second one was 
to improve our security, scalability, and resilience. That translates to faster queries, to just being, being faster delivering things. And the last one, we wanted to promote technology. On your previous uh, state, working on a shared data center, uh, we had a lot of stress on our Hadoop cluster. It was hard to promote innovation. Being in the cloud is just easier to facilitate. It's much faster to integrate new technologies. One of the challenges we faced was actually to, during this transition, was actually to maintain both environments at the same state. How could we provide the same data on our on-premise data center, but also in the cloud? We wanted to start to move our users, start to move our services to the cloud. And, and with that, uh, it was one of, the, one of the main challenge was to ensure the data on both sides. Uh, we use, uh, we, we, we use the, the power also of Expedia, which is such a large group, uh, and we develop an internal tool named Circus Train that basically replicates hive tables between clusters. Uh, it replicates not only the table, the data, but also the metadata associated with it. it it's quite light touch, and it can copy and partition the data or partition the data. It's not event-driven. Uh, it's still a batch process, but that allows us to start to move our users and our processes to the cloud. Uh, this is a quick example of Circus Train, a YAML file, a quite simple process that you can specify the source catalog, a replica, replica catalog, uh, and also a table of replication options. With the challenges of all those brands that Mariana presented in the beginning, moving to the cloud, what we faced was we moved from a centralized world where the data was just in one place to a decentralized world. Of course, wanting to promote innovation, scalability, all those good parts, but also we had this bad part. Suddenly, we start to create a, this sense of data silos across the organization. Suddenly, because we also use shared services across uh, the, the Expedia group, it was becoming hard to reach out to, to other groups' data or to other companies' data. For that purpose, uh, one thing we decided or we thought about was thinking about data and data lakes as federated data lakes in a way that data lakes can, can be connected with each other. It won't be different for me to access my data from uh, uh, HCOM uh, Hive Metastore or from uh, EPS Hive Metastore. Through this federation access, uh, easily we could facilitate and again accelerate the, the access to, to our data. For that, uh, we also developed on Expedia Group a tool named Waggle Dance. Uh, both Circus Train and Waggle Dance are both uh, open source. You can check on GitHub. And Waggle Dance is basically a request routing for Hive Metastore that basically proxies the requests for the right Metastore, whatever, whatever data lake where you are, where you're trying to access it. Uh, again, simple YAML configuration. We have it running across all the entire uh, numerous numbers of uh, accounts on AWS that we have. We use Waggle Dance to federate all the information on. Another, another focus or another vector in terms of our, one of the, the solid foundation is the data quality framework. So from the beginning, you wanted to have trust. And for that, we wanted to manage our data assets like we manage any other product. Uh, we wanted to promote instrumentation, observability, and other thing. Ultimately, we wanted to be the first to know, like we are down, and if are, our service is down for any reason, we want to apply the same principles to our data assets. If some process fails, we want it to be the first to know. To know when the data is accessible, if it's fresh enough, complete, accurate, enrich it, or integrate it. Second principle uh, that follows the solid foundation is we want it to be easy to produce data. With the uh, ex exploits of microservices, with the exploit of uh, serverless, we suddenly move from monolithic architectures to uh, 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 an enormous number of services that every week, every day, they are created or in the cloud. For that, we want it to be extremely easy from start, from when you start your first development, 
or your first code commit to start to produce data to our data lake. We moved away from four uh, near real-time services we had internally or previously to just one. There was a massive movement we had to do, but we wanted to concentrate that. Uh, that uh, we wanted to find one way to produce data. That we obviously choose Kafka as kind of our main ingestion engine uh, that gives us scalability, performance, and efficiency for the 10 terabytes of data we ingest every day and increasing uh, every day. We wanted a simplified schema management uh, support on all the environments, as I mentioned, from labs to staging to production. And at the end, we want to strive to a full hands uh, off service. With the fa facilitating data being produced, also uh, brought some responsibilities for the producers. We wanted to change the mindset of our producers. We, uh, in the past, uh, our services, our monolithic services, they were producing data, and they were not worried about the data they were creating, or even the downstream service they were consuming that data. So we defined this contract, which is basically telling our producers when they are on board on our platform that they own the data schema that they are managing, they own the data they are producing, they should stream events in real time, they should obfuscate sensitive information, they should try to document and update those data assets so people can consume it easily, and also monitor the data that's being produced just like they're monitoring their service. Obviously, we are uh, providing um, simple ways to produce data, and, and which, which then sets and jumps for the, the, the third guideline uh, of, of the platform. We want to be easy to consume data too. Easy to produce, easy to consume data. Uh, we provide, being in the cloud, it's just much, much easier. You want it to benefit from that. So even if those bullet points they are in there, they sound big, actually, we are just leveraging the capability of being in the cloud. So we provide easily Hive, Preston, Spark on almost any versions that they want. Uh, we use EMR for data processing as a native solution from AWS. We use Databricks heavily on data science side. We use Kubel for query insights across the business, and we use Athena for our operational support. Along that, uh, we also build an analytics API that uh, basically allows programmatically access to uh, any analytic data at, with a granular ACL or, or access control level uh, on data sets, column, and rows. Uh, we allow people or services to consume analytics data, to search for data, break down, filter, uh, to build time series, do comparisons, forecasts on key data sets, and we allow that on a simple and uh, fast way with a sub-second response time. The fourth pillar is that data science pushes the envelope, and pushes the envelope in many fronts. Uh, pushes the envelope on the development cycle from models tuning, algorithms training, and model storage, on the features pipeline that support that development cycle, on the batch execution where we are able to execute back testing on any new models uh, that have been developed or new algorithms trained, and also obviously with that comes a performance evaluation and observ observability. Obviously, the goal is to those machine learning models not to exist in an offline world, actually to become and to move to the to online world. And for that, we have a machine learning service that we call Decision Engine, where we deploy those models on the continuous integrations and continuous delivery uh, methods. This is the phase of the time where actually the software engineering patterns, the best practices, come together and join with the data science world. Uh, we Obviously, we have online feature store, model serializations, we have model serving, we use different, we serve different types of models from MLIP, TensorFlow, PMML. At the end, as I was mentioned, we want to uh, 
deliver the best hotel for our for for the customer at the right time, at the best price, uh, and for that, uh, that's kind of why we have all this massive architecture behind. Uh, I used to say internally that to achieve all that, it takes a village. Uh, it's the scale of our operation and the scale of our data and the challenges that are put up to us is kind of uh, defines the full picture. Just to finalize uh, the, 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 the meaning of it takes a village, I also used to say that this is no, not more than just software development. Uh, it's important to have cross-functional teams coming together, have, have, have a solid platform to build on top, promote best engineering practices, uh, having, and this is very important, especially when working with a person like Marianne, which is have a critical execution path, really be really nimble to achieve something quickly and deliver value, and then, of course, measure an operational cost to see the impact. That's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, please. If not, uh, we'll be available outside for any conversation, if needed. Someone question upstairs. Just shout. It's fine. We can hear you. You can talk Spanish too, so. <laughs> Much better in Spanish. Or Portuguese. Oh, there you go. Portuguese. Bit, uh, Obrigado. <laughs> well done. Como vai vos? <laughs> so thanks a lot for the presentation. So my question is, how long did it take to build this whole thing? Uh, we are still building. <laughs> it is still evolving. Uh, we, uh, and I, I think that is, what's important for us is to have that solid foundation, those principles and it needs to be clear to everyone. So that when you have a new component coming, it makes sense on the full picture. So we are still building, still evolving. You have data scientists pushing us for new algorithms to be deployed. We have to find a solution. But the principles and the guidelines are the one actually that they are there and they, they make sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think, well, we started our cloud migration around two years ago and that's where we decided to build the new EPS data cloud. Um, so we've been at it, you know, actively for one and a half years. I don't see it, I don't see it ending any time at all, right? Because data keeps evolving and our systems keep evolving. I think you do have the advantage if you're doing a project like this that we had all the old systems still in place while we're doing the new systems, right? So you create some data replication processes and basically you don't have to interrupt your business while you keep doing the new thing. But then at some point you need to switch over, okay, from the old data warehouse to the new data warehouse. Uh, so that you have that flexibility. But other than that, I think we definitely have a few more years ahead of us <laughs> before we can rest, take a holiday to Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's another question there. Yeah. I saw on the slides that you use uh, Databricks notebooks, you use Hive, Athena. What do you exactly use Quobol for? Quobol. Quobol is our Hive. Uh, is our U uh, interface basically? So allow us to. Uh, we have also they also have notebooks, uh, and basically we use that for Hive to run Hive to run Spark. Uh, we use both basically. Databricks is more popular with data science, uh, while Qball is kind of more used across the the other units and functions in the yeah. business. Okay, thanks. And, and also, if you have too much money in your pocket and it's burning. Just get Qball and you know it goes away very quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way. The, the 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 benefit is by being in the cloud and having the right interfaces in there. It's just easy to plug things, and easy to try. Easy to try a new vendor. Easy to try new solutions. And when you are on premise data center, it's much much harder. Okay, since I still have the mic. How yep. do you organize or orchestrate all the jobs, all the pipelines? What do you use for that? So that's a good point. Uh, orchestrations, we 
we had Informatica, we had Azkaban, we moved then to Airflow, uh, we also have data scientists using Luigi, but the things that actually excite me more, all of those solutions we have to pay a lot. The, most, the one that excites me more is actually starting to use serverless. So, in example, in AWS, we have uh, lambdas, and we can leverage the power of step functions. We just pay for the execution. We actually don't pay for the full cluster of those or that orchestrate they're running. And most importantly, you have observations, you have monitoring, and you are sure that thing won't go down because it's serverless and it's maintained by AWS. So that's the thing that excites me now to, to, to orchestrate our jobs. Thank you, everyone. Well, then, thank you. Cheers.